Hello, everybody, um, and my apologies for the technical difficulties that we had in the last session. Um, I hope it didn't uh, upset your enjoyment too much. It was the most ambitious thing we've tried to run. We will run the breakout rooms uh, more successfully tomorrow, I guarantee. Uh, and this session, of course, is beginning late. We're going to wait just a couple of minutes to allow people to make their way from the session on um, sustain, sustainability to uh, the new session, which will be uh, run by Leanne Steenkamp on aiming for carbon neutrality. It follows on perfectly, uh, but just bear with us for a couple of minutes while we give people a little bit of time out so that they can find their way here. I'm afraid technical glitches do happen. It wasn't at our end, I have to say. It was at the end of the uh, of the uh, events our platform. They had a problem with the breakout room, but we are going to start this session in um, one minute's time at 35 minutes past the hour. But, so do stay online. I'm just going to put a holding slide for the moment, but Leanne will be coming in very shortly. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to Dr. Leanne Skienkamp's session. Dr. Leanne Skienkamp holds a PhD in climate change law, and she is a lecturer at the University of Stellenbosch Business School. She has also published widely in the areas of environment climate change. And I am so proud to, to announce that she's also an extraordinary professor at the University of South Africa. Welcome, Dr. Leanne Skienkamp. Thank you so much, Roshana, for the kind introduction. And welcome, everyone, to this session. Um, I wish that I could see you in person and that we could discuss our ideas afterwards. Um, nevertheless, I'm honored to have this opportunity to talk to you today about carbon neutrality and why I believe that companies should, in fact, go one step beyond and become zero euros. Next slide, please. So our topic for today is aiming for carbon neutrality. And as I mentioned, businesses should become zero euro. Next slide. Our agenda for today um, is I will start off with discussing climate change in brief and then look at some of the terminology that's used by corporates in their financial statements as well as in their uh, marketing material. So coming from an accounting and tax background and then moving into environmental law, I'm very interested um, to see how these disciplines intersect. And this topic is a perfect fit for my own research agenda. Next, we're going to look at some of the benefits of going zero, and we'll do a nice practical example looking at the Apple company and uh, doing a quick uh, poll there. I will then conclude with some thoughts on how to charter the pathway to net zero. I hope there's time for some questions at the end. Next slide, please. So our point of departure is the recently released uh, climate change report um, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And this is their sixth assessment report. 
it's quite a depressing report. Um, and I thought it's better to show you a video of around three and a half minutes that perfectly encapsulates the main points uh, of this report. And then we'll come back and take it further. Uh, so David, if you'd be so kind as to start the video and students, my apologies, if there are some technical difficulties with the video, it's quite a large uh, video that I've downloaded. I've caused some headache for, for the team, uh, but let's see how it goes. So David, if you can share that um, first video, yeah. please. Don't hear anything, David? I'm going to have to bring it in. Okay. Apologies. Let's just give a couple of seconds. I do want you to see this video. They explain it a lot better than I do. Yeah. yeah. Making you probably want to keep in mind. Okay, we can hear it now. every region on our planet. Strong, rapid, sustained reductions in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions would be required to limit global warming. This report doesn't tell us what to do. It doesn't say you have to do this and then you have to do this. It doesn't provide us with such solutions. We are the ones who need to take to take the decisions and we are the ones who need to be brave and ask the, the difficult questions to ourselves. Like, what do we value? Um, are we ready to take action to, to ensure future and present living conditions? So I hope that this can be a wake up call and that it really gives perspective and that it once again can be a reminder that the climate crisis has not gone away. It's only escalating and it's only growing more intense by the hour. If we stop warming at 1.5 degrees, um, then we will also stop many of these extremes from getting worse and um, and I think that um, and and while we are committed to some changes particularly sea level rise glacier mill still to come for for many decades we can slow these changes down um, and we can stop many of the others from getting worse by um, urgently and drastically reducing um, CO2 emissions in the next decade. Thank you, David. If we can go back to the slides. So apologies for the, for the poor quality, but hopefully you uh, were able to pick up on the main message. The first being that this is the first comprehensive report that focuses on when the world might pass the one and a half degrees or two degrees Celsius warming levels. And importantly, it's also the first time that the IPCC has explicitly linked human activity 
with climate change. You might have heard the term uh, anthropomorphic, so it's human-caused climate change. So yes, it's not a feel-good video, but we have to face facts so that we can start addressing it. And business has an incredibly important role um, to play in this regard. So this report underlines the urgency of taking action to slow down climate change. But that being said, they also acknowledge that some of these changes are irreversible. We've passed some tipping points or some points of no return. But we have to look forward and see what we can change and what we can slow down. So what actions are necessary to limit uh, this global warming? Of course, to rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions across the globe, not just some nations, all nations, especially the biggest emitters, and I'm sorry to say that my home country, South Africa, is among the top 15 carbon dioxide emitters in the globe, uh, on the globe. We also have to reach net zero emissions by 2050. It's, it's an ambitious target, but it's a necessary target. Next slide, please. So I'm very interested um, to see how you would rank different business threats. And I'll tell you why in a moment. So can I ask that you go to this website, menti.com, that's M-E-N-T-I, you can use your mobile device, and it's going to ask you to type in a code. It's anonymous, and um, please uh, do participate. I've set aside two minutes for that, so go to menti.com, and I will share the results in a moment as I see the votes coming through. So I want you to envision that you are the CEO of a company, whether it's a big multinational company or a small business, and there are seven business threats that I want you to rank, one being the riskiest threat or the biggest threat in your mind, given your business, your sector, your country. So please rank those seven threats from most important to least important, and I'm going to share the results and then compare it with a global survey that was conducted earlier this year. So I'm going to share my screen in a moment. Okay, and you should be able to see um, a picture, a PowerPoint on your screen. I'll just give a minute or so for you to participate. Thank you for those that have already started voting. You'll see there are cyber threats, social instability, pandemics, overregulation, tax policy, climate change, uncertain economic growth. And I put them there in no particular order. It's not an exhaustive list, I know. And I see 12 people have already participated. Thank you so much. So I will give one minute and then I'm going to close the voting. Maybe I should also participate and cast my vote. Okay, 23 students have participated. And remember, this is for this point in time, for your country, for your business. We have about half a minute left. And I will share the global survey and let's compare results. Okay, you've got 10 seconds left. And that's it. Voting is closed. Thank you so much for those who have participated. So ranking from the highest risk, uncertain economic growth, followed by cyber threats, pandemics, social instability, and climate change, the fifth uh, highest risk that you've identified. Thank you, David. You can bring the uh, PowerPoint back up for us. There we go. Next slide, please. So every year, the big auditing firm PwC 
conduct a global survey and um, where they also ask the CEOs to rank the different business streets. There's a lot more than those I've included in my list. But what you see for the 2021 results is that climate change didn't even make the top five. Um, so according to over the 5,000 CEOs who participated, um, climate change is only number eight on this list. Now, I hope that those CEOs uh, read the IPCC report or watch you know, some of the videos that were made on this to, to realize the magnitude of this crisis that is facing us. Now, of course, pandemic should rank right at the top. COVID-19 is so in our face at the moment, but it has resulted in other issues being placed on the back burner. And I think climate change should regain some prominence there. Just another interesting statistic, when I went into that report, it said that 30% uh, of CEOs selected climate change as extreme concern. 27% were not concerned at all. So I don't know in what little world of their own they live. And uh, when CEOs were asked uh, what areas should they disclose more information on, um, it said that 60% um, have not yet factored climate change into their risk management activities, and 43% indicated that there needs to be higher, uh, higher disclosure on these environmental aspects. So there's a bit of a disconnect for me having climate change ranking so low, but at the same time, CEOs recognizing that they need to disclose more information. So I just thought it was interesting to compare your results with the survey. Next slide, please. So over the past few years, we've seen an explosion in the number of companies that are announcing that they are going net zero or carbon neutral or plan to do so by 2030. Uh, or 2040 even. And I think we're all familiar with the big multinationals like Facebook, Google, Unilever, they've all jumped on the bandwagon. Um, and even the major oil companies like BP and Shell. And if you're rolling your eyes here at the moment, as I'm tempted to do, and thinking that this is just the latest PR stunt, you're not necessarily wrong. And I'm not saying these companies are greenwashing. What I do want you to know is that it is possible for companies to create the impression that they are carbon neutral when in fact they are not. So it's important that we look at the different terminology. The reason I chose uh, these products or brands is because they were interesting and they come from different parts of the world. I didn't go into any of their climate uh, strategies. I didn't evaluate them, but let's just have a quick look there. At the top right hand corner, you see ZZC zero carbon coffee. They claim they're the first and only coffee brand that is climate neutral certified. So that was quite interesting to me. And in the bottom left hand corner, we have the ride sharing app Hitch. And Hitch claims that they are also carbon zero. So they incentivize uh, people to share a rides and they reward you by planting more trees. And by planting more trees, that's a form of, of a carbon offset. Then in the top left hand corner, we have Sendal, which is Australia's first carbon neutral uh, delivery service. They also make use of carbon offsets. At the bottom right hand corner, we have Heathrow Airport in London, who pledged to be carbon neutral by 2030, but then you have to read the small print, excluding the emissions from all the flights going in and out of Heathrow, which is the major cause of the emissions. So at least the buildings uh, will be carbon neutral. And then the last example, first time I've come across a climate positive burger. And this is from a family owned restaurant in Sweden. And the reason they go climate positive is because they capture more carbon than what they emit. Uh, so uh, that was an interesting observation to me. So we've got zero carbon, carbon zero, carbon neutral, climate positive. What, what does all this mean? So let's go to the next slide and unpack some of this terminology. So when you go into the IPCC report, and there are various websites as well, the United Nations has a lot of documentation, the Paris Agreement has information, we find some standardized terminology. So let's start from the, from the top down. Absolute zero is, as the name suggests, absolutely zero emissions. So there's no emissions that can be attributed to you, you being the entity, whether it's a corporate or a city or a state or a country across all scopes. And in a minute or so, I'll tell you a bit more about the various scopes of emissions. So absolute zero. 
Then we move down a bit to net zero and carbon neutral. Now, these two are very similar, but there is an important distinction. So most companies in their financials, in the integrated report, the sustainability report, will tell you they are going carbon neutral. And that could very well be the fact, but we should be aiming for net zero. So net zero says we have to reduce emissions following a science-based approach. So not just, you know, some vague statements. It's very specific mathematical calculations supported by peer-reviewed scientific evidence while fully neutralizing or cancelling any remaining emissions. And importantly, by using like-for-like like removals. So it's like comparing apples with apples. If you emit carbon dioxide, you're going to remove carbon dioxide. If you emit methane gas, you're going to uh, remove methane gas. So it's like for like removals. Whereas carbon neutral is less strict. There's no mention of science-based targets and there's no mention of like for like removals. So you emit and you remove, that's it. So carbon neutral, is a good starting point for companies. I'm not bashing carbon neutrality. I'm saying we should be aiming higher, which is removing emissions, using science-based targets, and using like-for-like -like removals. The ultimate target is going carbon negative, like that hamburger we saw. So uh, companies tend to use either climate positive or carbon negative, which sounds contradictory, but it really means the same thing. What it says is they remove more than what they emit. And again, it's like for like removals and following science-based targets. Right, so now that we've established that, let's go on to the next slide. And being an accountant, I like equations and the accounting equation should always be in balance. So I think we can depict it as follows. We have emissions on the one side, we have removals on the other side. And we're trying to balance that so that we get to carbon neutral, even better to net zero. And hopefully eventually we'll get to carbon negative where we have more removals than emissions. So by removing more carbon dioxide from the air than what we pump into the atmosphere, we can get to net zero. And there are various strategies for, for doing this. Um, we, we see there's a huge uptake in renewable energy, energy efficiency, avoiding deforestation. And those strategies are all incredibly important, but they are not enough. So we require net zero strategies. So we have to do even more. We have to remove the existing carbon from the atmosphere that's been pumped into there for the last couple of decades. So we do that through various technologies or through um, natural strategies. So you capture uh, and store the carbon dioxide and you can store it through various means natural means such as trees and plants, soil carbon sequestration, the ocean, materials like concrete. And there's also more and more advanced climate technology that also captures that carbon. So in sum, carbon neutrality is a good starting point, but it does not reduce overall emissions. And that's what we should be aiming for. It's not enough to increase your emissions and then just purchase a carbon offset or buy a carbon credit asking someone else to plant trees on your behalf, but you don't actually change your behavior. Right, next slide, please. Earlier on, I mentioned um, that there are different scopes of emissions. So there's scope one, scope two, and scope three. Scope one emissions, and this is how scientists account for uh, emissions. Scope one are direct emissions that are created by your activities. For example, you have a truck that you, that you use to transport your goods from your warehouse uh, to your shop. And the exhaust fumes of that truck causes direct emissions. Um, or you have generators that you use as backup power energy in your factory. So that's scope one emissions. Scope two emissions are indirect, caused by the electricity or heat that you purchase in order to run your business. For example, the light bulbs that you have in your office building. So the electricity that you use for that. Scope three are also indirect emissions, but it's much broader. It's from all your other activities. And that's a really difficult one to mention, uh, to measure. So there are many different carbon 
uh, footprint calculators out there on the internet. The trickiest one is for the scope three emissions. And it can be quite extensive. In fact, scope three can often be much larger than scope one and two combined. So it's incredibly important that businesses account specifically for scope three emissions as well. So there are companies who say they are going carbon neutral, but then they're only talking about scope one or scope two. So scope three is across your entire um, supply chain, the materials in your building, the business travel of your employees. So it's the full life cycle of your products, even going so far as your customers using those products. Next slide, please. Right, now we have a better understanding of the terminology and the scope of emissions. Um, we have to find some standardized way of disclosing that in the financials because corporate net zero targets are being approached inconsistently. We saw that in the slide with the burger and the ride sharing app, all the different terminologies floating about. So it's difficult to weigh one uh, company against another and make an informed decision. So that is why the recommendations from the task force on climate related financial disclosures, the TCFD, came about back in 2017. And their goal is to improve and increase the reporting of climate related financial information. At this stage, it's still a voluntary matter in most countries, but we see the adoption of this as a mandatory reporting requirement uh, in more and more countries as governments realize the importance of this. So one aspect, and I would argue perhaps the most important aspect of climate change accounting relates to carbon disclosures. And this is where the carbon disclosure project, the CDP, which you see on the bottom half of the slide, comes in so handy. It's a not-for-profit organization. All the data is freely available on their website. You just need to spend some time you know, getting acquainted with it and downloading what you need. In fact, I'm actually busy with a study that uses the CDP data for South African companies. Now, the way uh, the, the CDP project works is that they approach the top listed companies in each country and invite the company to participate in a survey. So if the company accepts, they complete a questionnaire, which is a very lengthy questionnaire. Uh, I have to admit it, it takes a long time to complete it. And then they use CDP scoring methodology and they're very transparent about the methodology as well. And at the end of this whole process, they release the score. And it's across three metrics. One is for climate change, which is the one that we're interested in today. The other is forestry management, and the other is water stewardship. And then they rank the companies, and the score ra ranges from A, which is the highest score, to F, which is essentially a fail. And they release this information, anyone can access it. So it's useful both for potential investors of the company, but also for the company itself, because they can benchmark against their peers and it can hopefully help them to progress and get to an A score. So the latest available results is for 2020 and the A list uh, companies across the world numbered 277. So I would encourage you if you're interested in this type of, of work to go to the CDP website and extract the information there. Next slide, please. So on the point of benchmarking, um, I think it's interesting to compare the performance of the climate change leaders, the so-called A-list, with those of their peers or the sector that they're operating. Now, I'm not a financial analyst, and I know there's a lot of other variables that need to be taken into account. You're not going to just look at the CDP score. But as a point of departure, I think it's quite useful. Now, on the right-hand side of the slide, you may be familiar with some of these sustainability indexes, the Dow Jones or the FTSE for Good. Now, on the left-hand side, that graph that you see, to my knowledge, this is the first ever index that specifically tracks the A-listing CDP uh, companies. And what we can see from that graph, the top line, the, the one in red, that is the stock's global Climate Change Leaders Index. And from December 2011 to December 2020, it has outperformed the stock's global um, 1800 index by about 3.9% per annum. So the A-listers have outperformed the rest. Of course, an important caveat here, 
This graph illustrates that there is a correlation between the CDP score and your market performance. I would be careful to say that there is a causal relationship. One needs to conduct more research into this, and that is exactly what I'm doing with Johannesburg Stock Exchange, JSE listed companies, tracking their CDP scores over time with their share prices and price earnings ratio, et cetera. But I think this does give us an indication that doing good can be good for business. This is just one metric. Next slide, please. Right, so what are some of the benefits of becoming a zero hero? In addition to potentially outperforming your peers on the stock exchange, there are numerous other benefits. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. But what I do want you to take away is that when you think of the integrated report and all the stakeholders that are involved, they are all affected by your climate change strategy or lack thereof. So the benefits of becoming zero hero is the message that you send out to investors, to regulators, to your own employees. You could have financial benefits in the sense that your revenue can go up. If you invest in so-called greener products or services, you can get a competitive edge and boost your revenue. At the same time, you can drive down your costs by becoming more energy efficient and investing in climate uh, technology. So thereby you increase your profit. What we also see is if you start addressing the, the very real risks uh, related to climate change and you bring that into your overall business strategy, that boosts your company's reputation. So what do I mean by climate change risks? Well, first and foremost um, are the actual physical risks brought about by climate change. So companies will have to face more frequent and more severe weather events. So in companies that have physical as uh, assets, especially those in vulnerable sectors like agriculture, real estate and transport, will have to factor in those risks um, in their business decisions. We also expect to see an increase in regulations, more and more uh, countries adopting that TCFD uh, type of accounting. And there are also transition risks. The world is slowly but surely transitioning to a low carbon economy and you can't afford to be left behind. So if your country stated that they're going to shut down coal fired power stations, or they're going to phase out um, vehicles so that you only have battery electric vehicles, for example, what are you going to do with your vehicle fleet? How are your employees going to commute to and from work? How will you, uh, you know, relate to your customers. So those are all aspects that you need to take into account. And if you can get it right and be proactive, not reactive, and properly become a zero hero and get on that pathway to net zero, you can outperform your competitors and lead the charge against climate change. Next slide, please. Right, now we get to our interesting exercise. This video will be a lot better, I promise. It's also a lot more positive. We're going to watch a very short one and a half minute video that Apple made uh, where they detail their carbon neutral commitment. And afterwards, I'm going to ask you to participate in a poll. So you have to uh, envision that you are a climate conscious investor and all else being equal, did this video then make you more or less likely to buy shares in Apple. So David, if you can please share the Apple video for us. Apple has a plan and a promise to make Apple carbon neutral. Wait, no, we've already done that. To make every single Apple product carbon neutral by 2030. Even yours. We're working to make every iPhone, iPad, watch and Mac with 100% recycled or renewable materials. We're finding new ways to extract aluminum, steel, tin, tungsten and plastic from recycled Apple products. We're growing enough trees and recycling enough paper to sustain all our packaging. But we can do much more. It's not just what goes into our products, it's also how they're made. Hundreds of manufacturers, distributors, testers, assemblers, disassemblers, and material makers, all upgrading to 100% renewable energy. A lot of them are even going zero waste, but it's still not enough. Manufacturing is just a part of it. What about all of you? This is a big one. Apple devices are all over the world. And by 2030, all of the electricity charging all of your devices will be 100% renewable. So you're a part of this too. Because Apple is going carbon neutral. No, everything Apple is going carbon neutral. Apple has a plan. So 
Thank you, David. Um, right, so David, if you can launch the uh, poll for us, and then students, if you can please indicate, are you now more or less likely to buy shares in Apple? There we go. I'll give it a few more seconds. So far, the majority indicates that they are more likely. Don't sway to peer pressure, cast your vote. And in five seconds, I think we can close the poll, please. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for casting your vote. The vast majority, 65%, said they are more likely to buy shares in Apple, 30% remained neutral, and then 5% said less likely. Thank you so much, David. You can bring uh, the slide back up for us. So I do want to have some time at the end. In the meantime, uh, can I ask students if you can use the Q&A session just to, cast, uh, to write your uh, ideas or thoughts there. Why did you say you were more likely? Why did you say you were less likely? So I'll tell you what I thought. When I saw the video, especially after I read the depressing IPCC report, I was so excited. Um, and I don't even have any Apple products. Um, so I was moved to buy shares in Apple. And then I chatted to my husband, who is the voice of reason. And we got you thinking, and I'm not bashing Apple. I don't own shares in Apple. But just got you thinking, OK, right, you have to ask more questions. So I invite you to go to Apple's website. Um, that they showed at the end of the video, that forward slash 2030, to read through their climate change report or strategy and check the information that they disclosed there. And I'll unpack it a bit in the next slide. So I think it's certainly a step in the right direction, extremely ambitious, and typically South African, where we struggle with extended blackouts, which we call load shedding. Um, I was wondering how on earth can Apple guarantee that Apple products in South Africa will be charged by renewable energy because our country certainly is not going quickly enough in the renewable energy direction. So uh, maybe in your country you experience something similar. So please do share your thoughts in the Q&A and I'll ask Krishana to moderate that for me. Can we go to the, okay, yes, we are on the right slide. Thank you. So when you look at this video at any other company's uh, claims, there are different things that, that we need to be aware of when we deconstruct those targets. So research has shown us that these targets tend to differ across three important dimensions. We have to look at the range of emission sources and the activities that are included. Secondly, look at the timeline. And thirdly, how companies are planning to achieve their target. Is it just this vague uh, you know, wish or ideal that they have? Or do they have detailed step-by-step -step ways of reaching that? Now, of course, in a one-minute video, it's impossible for Apple to detail everything, which is why you need to go and read that report. So I think we can summarize it in these uh, four uh, steps or aspects on this slide. Look at the scope of the climate impacts. So does the company address all greenhouse gas emissions or just carbon dioxide, which is the most important one? But you have to look, is it appropriate for that company, for that industry that they are in? Do they only talk about greenhouse gases or do they talk about other climate impacts like waste reduction? Um, like water uh, stewardship, like uh, reforestry activities. Then the next aspect we need to be aware of is the scope of the activities. Do they just talk about their operations like Heathrow Airport? Does it include the entire supply chain and value chain? Does it include the customers like Apple said in their video? What else do they, do they cover? Then importantly, what is the actual mitigation strategy? Is it vague or do they have those detailed steps? Do they talk about carbon neutral or net zero? Do they talk about how they're going to finance this transition? Because it does cost money to transition to a low uh, carbon uh, business. How are they going to remove the uh, carbon emissions? Are they going to purchase carbon offsets or carbon credits? 
Um, are they going to invest in carbon capture and storage uh, technology? Let's look at that in the strategy. And then, of course, the time frame. There has to be, of course, long-term commitments, but we can't afford to wait until 2050. So there has to be short-term, medium-term commitments as well. And then the final slide, please. Some closing thoughts on how a company can transform to net zero. I think it's clear that it will take a concerted and collaborative effort from government, from business, from NGOs, from the public to tackle this problem. We can't just leave it up to government. We can't just leave it up to business. It is really a collaborative effort. But government has to set the stage. So it's, it's government's role to create this enabling environment so that businesses can thrive and really tackle this issue. So we need a legislative and policy and market package um, to, to combat climate change. So government, of course, has various tools at their disposal. Um, we can see increased regulation. The government can use market-based instruments like carbon taxes. There could be emissions trading systems, ETS, as we have in Europe and China. Government can decide to ban um, for example, internal combustion uh, engine vehicles, phase out coal power, fossil fuel subsidies um, could be recalibrated. We could have the mandatory adoption of those TCFD accounting principles and level the playing field um, across companies and regions and countries for that matter. From a business perspective, there is an imperative on all organizations, large and small, public and private, um, to really achieve net zero in the shortest amount of time as is possible. And to that end, I suggest that the following nine aspects, which you see in those blocks at the right hand side, be incorporated into the climate change strategy. And that strategy should form part of your overall business strategy. So I'm not going into the detail, but it ranges from setting your targets. What is your ambition and being very explicit there scope one, scope two, scope three, all the way to the way that you communicate it to your stakeholders. How transparent are you? Do you engage with the government? Do you engage with your employees? Do you engage with your customers? And this should be across your entire supply chain, as I mentioned before. So I hope that in today's session, um, you've learned something new, something interesting perhaps in my talk and that I've convinced you why it's important for businesses not just to aim for carbon neutrality, but to really get on the pathway and become zero euros. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, maybe if we can just spend one minute, Roshana, are there any questions uh, that, that I can address? Thank you. Dr. Stiankamp, I just want to say that you've really ignited some conversation in the Q&A box this afternoon. I hope it's a good conversation because I haven't looked at it. <laughs> really good conversation, I must say. A lot of Thank skepticism you. with regards to the Apple and, and, uh, Apple and, and what they have planned. Um, one question for you that I, I think um, really latches on to what you had mentioned earlier, and that question would be, do you think that more and more companies will participate in the carbon disclosure project? Question, Roshana. Um, I, I think the answer is yes. As we see an increase in regulation and more jurisdictions adopting either an emissions trading scheme or carbon taxes, South Africa being, I think, one of the most recent countries to adopt one, uh, companies will be forced, in a sense, to disclose their carbon emissions and their targets. So they will, they will have to come on board at one stage or another. So I do foresee that more companies will participate in the CDP and not just participate, but improve their rankings as well. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Stenkamp, uh, let's also just hope that some of the business leaders as well as future business leaders in the session today will also have some food for thought towards becoming that zero hero that you have proposed us to be. And thank you so much. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your expertise and thank you for sharing all these insights with us this afternoon. I wish you all the best for the rest of the week and enjoy all the sessions. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed for um, and also for your forbearance because we had to start a little bit later than planned. If you'd like to move back now to the timeline, uh, the next session, which is another panel, will be beginning in um, around uh, 10 minutes time. So have a coffee, or move to the coffee chats, uh, stretch your legs, uh, do whatever you need to do, and we'll see you in the next session in about 10 minutes time. Thanks a lot and bye-bye.